Okay, we're having an emotional moment here. Right? Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to get into the class, I think, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. All right. So, first of all, yeah. I don't know whether I'm talking to the people here, the people there. <laughs> we have a few audiences. Alumni ad that we recorded, that we Zoom. Oh, it's recorded? Yeah. My order that you make it as a Zoom. There you go. Yeah. I wasn't an alumni. I'm not an alumni. Yeah, soon you're going to be alumni also. <laughs> After <Shana> Bet. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, um, the uh, the theme for the uh, for this particular what am I going to call this alumni gather yeah, like what, what what exactly do we call this? An um, alumni day of learning. <laughs> We're letting you practice be alumni early because you, know, so you shouldn't you should the transition shouldn't be so difficult. Yeah, I know. Just uh, for those of you who are way in the back there, I'll I'll try and speak a little louder. If those uh, those twenty five rows could just like uh, keep it down a little bit, so everyone will be able to hear. <clears throat> okay, the theme, the theme of our of uh, of the of this uh, uh, alumni day of learning is obviously Shavuot, which is uh, soon upon us, uh, the time of Kabbalat Torah, which is really. Would be accurate to, scri- to describe it as the high point of Jewish history. We talk a lot about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Our identity is very deeply tied to Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, and of course, everyone knows the famous Ramban, the end of Parshas Bo, right? That uh, talks, that makes clear the idea that it's really the foundation of our Amuna. Right? We always go back to that moment. But what's made absolutely clear both in Chumash itself and certainly the way Chazal read the Chumash is that that departure was for a very specific purpose, which was to eventually get ourselves to Har Sinai to get the Torah. When Moshe Rabbeinu is told at the burning bush that he's going back down to Mitzrayim to take the Jews out, his first question is, you know, on what merit? And the Kaddish Baruch's answer is, you're standing on it right here. Because they're going to be coming back. You're going to, you're going to lead them to Har Sinai to get the Torah. Kabbalah's Torah is not the end of Jewish history, right? After all, again, it's one of the holidays in the calendar. It's not the last holiday. It's the second of the big three. If, we, if we're looking for something that, that, that connects us up to the end of Jewish history, that would be Sukkot, because there's another step after we get the Torah, which is once we've gotten it, we need to bring it down into the world, we have to come into Eretz Yisrael, based on Miktash, right? The Haftorah of Sukkot is the one that connects us to Gogu Magog. The end of Jewish history is much more deeply connected to Sukkot, but certainly, Shavuot is the high point in the sense that that moment on Har Sinai was one of supreme closeness between ourselves and the Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's the moment in time, after creation, the time when humanity got as close to Kaddish Baruch Hu as we would, at least in the context of this world. The Midrashim talk about the fact that all the different levels of the Shamayim were opened up. There was a level of insight there which won't be repeated until, uh, so long as this world is this world. But, okay, having said that, what's it all about? Like, what are we trying to achieve, right? We've been preparing for this day. We're still in the process of it. Right now we're on the uh, the 41st day of the Omer, right? We've uh, we've been working. We've been focusing. We're building towards this thing. But what is what is it that we're trying to achieve? What are we really moving towards? And what is the preparation we need to do to get ready for it? We revisit this moment every year. What are we? What, what's it all about? We can start by saying that if you see Mitzrayim itself, which is so central to us, was only for the sake of coming to receive the Torah, then it's clear that whatever the actual departure from Egypt was about was something that was incomplete, right? It was the beginning of something, but not the end of something. So we had a chance to spoke up, speak about this quite a bit during the last few weeks, which is that the real theme of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim is not merely getting out of the physical place of Egypt, but what it really meant to get out of Mitzrayim was to get out of 
a world which is defined by the physical context in which we find ourselves, to recognize that it's nothing more than a context to relate to something much larger and much higher. Right? And really the, the theme, the, 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 way that, the, the way that Chazal would frame it for us is we were leaving the Malchut of Paro to enter into the Malchut of Kaddish Baruch Hu. Right? There's no such thing as two kings for one crown. Everybody's got to serve something. So the question is, are you serving Paro with all the implications? Are you, are, is your whole world and reality defined by the physical world in which we find ourselves with all that comes together with that? Or is there something deeper? Are we connected to something larger? Is there a deeper definition of who we are than just our physical being and our awareness of that physical being? That's all about the Malchut of the Kaddish Baruch Hu, right? And that's really what leaving Egypt was all about, culminating in basically the Korban Pesach. We spoke about the fact that the Korban Pesach is the act by which we enter into that kingship of the Kaddish Baruch Hu. So the whole point is, that's a relationship. And all relationships have responsibilities. Right? I'm sure that if it hasn't already been discussed in Mrs. Levitan's class, it will be discussed. Right? All relationships have responsibilities. So if we're entering into this relationship of Malchut with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, that comes with responsibilities also. Like, what does a king do? What do kings do? Kings, they rule, right? They rule. They rule. They rule, they, they make rules, mitzvot. And the reality was, as we were leaving Mitzrayim, we may have made a claim. We may have, we have, we may have declared the fact that we recognize the Kaddish Baruch Hu as our Melech, but there really wasn't any content yet what that relation was really all about. There weren't any mitzvahs. Ramban also makes this particular point, not the famous Ramban at the end of Parshas Bo, but other famous Rambans. M- multiple times the Ramban cites a mechilta, a medrash, that talks about the fact that why, why do we juxtapose Anochi Hashem lo kecha in the Asarza Dibros with lo yeh Elohim acharim al panai, that there won't be another in front of me, Says the Mechilta, you accepted my Malchus in Mitzrayim. Now, here at Har Sinai, it's time to accept my decrees. Kibalti Malchusi to Kabel Gezerosai. It sounds like what Shavuos and Kabbalah Satorah is really all about is about the mitzvahs. However, if we re- remember back to that, what we might call the high point of the Seder, which was. The fact that we'd finally reached the point where we were confident we were going to make it to the meal. Right? Dayenu. Right? In the words of our Dayenu. Welcome all. Right? One of the, one of the, <clears throat> one of the stanzas in Dayenu was, Ilu kiravnu lifnei har sinai v'lo nosan lano es Torah Dayenu. If you'd brought us to har sinai and not given us the actual Torah, that would have been enough. Well, what does that mean? How do you understand that? How does that make any sense at all? How can we praise the Kaddish Baruch Hu for this moment of closeness at Har Sinai, distinct from receiving the actual Torah there? It's clear that the mitzvahs are not all that it's about. And for those of you who are listening, who spend time in Shana Bet, right, to go down memory lane, remember that the Pasuk in Shir Shirim, which references Shvuas and Kabbalah the Torah, is Yishikeni Minashikos Pihu Kitovin Do Dechamiyayin. The Kala in Shirashirin, remembering back to that moment, which again is actually referring to our Sinai, longingly says, Kiss me with the kisses of your mouth because your love is more dear than wine. Right? Wine here is actually referring to the actual Torah. And we're talking about over here, again, the actual the Yishikeni Minashikos Pihu. Right, the two kisses that are being referred to in the Pasek are actually referring to that moment of indescribable closeness that Klal Yisrael achieved with the Kaddish Baruch Hu and the Kaddish Baruch Hu actually spoke to us directly. Yishikeni minashikos kihu kitovim dodecha miyayin. Now the truth is, what that means is, we're actually talking about a moment where we're actually being commanded in a mitzvah, Anoch Hashem Elokecha, the mitzvah of Amunah, but it's clear from the emphasis in the Pasek, or at least we don't seem to be focusing exactly on the command aspect of it, ki tovim dodecha miyayin. Even better than the content of the Torah itself was that moment 
of inexpressible, inexplicable, inexplicable closeness, which we achieve with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. If we, want to, if we want to understand where Shlomo Melech is directing our attention and Chazal are directing our attention when they talk about what was happening there, they're interested in this moment of indescribable connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, which happened, which was the context within which we heard the Asar Zibras. This makes sense if we think about it. There's also something we've spoken about frequently. Again, we're entering into a relationship of Malchus. Malchus has rules. In our, in our context, we call those rules mitzvot. Right? We have all these commands from Kaddish Baruch Hu, the things that we need to do. But as we point out so often, Kaddish Baruch Hu, when he commands us to do things, he doesn't command us to do them because he needs the thing done. But Kaddish Baruch Hu needs something done. He created the world. He doesn't need us to accomplish tasks. Right? When we're commanded in the midst of tzedakah to give, to give money to the ani, it's not because he needs someone else to give the money to the ani. He's perfectly capable of doing it himself. He gives everybody else their, their parnasa. So why is it that we're commanded in the midst of tzedakah? Because of what happens to us as a result of doing those mitzvahs. <clears throat> Meaning how it is that we change and how we develop by doing these actions. Right? We have mitzvahs. Mitzvahs are the center point of the relationship, but it's a very unusual relationship of malchus. Usually <clears throat> a melech needs a vadim. He needs his servants because he wants things to be done. He can't do it himself. But that does not characterize our relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. He doesn't need us to accomplish something. So why are we the ones that are being commanded to do these things? It's because of how it is that we are transformed through doing those mitzvahs. Right? How we're transformed into how it is that we bond to a Kaddish Baruch Hu by doing these actions. Rav Dessler famously asks the question, what's more important, the Torah or the mitzvahs? And as we've described, when we, we think about, speak about this crucial Rav Dessler, right, when he talks about Torah, he's not talking about just the process of learning or the content of Torah. What he means is the internal awareness generated through Torah, that, that what we... That, 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 that inner sense of connectedness to the Kaddish Baruch what's more important, that or mitzvahs? So traditionally, we're taught, that what's, we're, what we're usually taught is, and we have to make the choice between those two, which one's more important? The mitzvahs are what's going on on the inside. Oh. What? But we've talked about this before, so we know what the answer to this question is, right? What? Rav Dessa tells us, sorry, he brings Chazals that go both ways, going in either direction, but he settles with the, with, 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 with the Zohar that tells us, Rachmana Libaboy, that the Torah really wants that internal self. Why then are we commanded in the mitzvahs? What's the point of the mitzvahs? So, if we understand that Rachmana Libaboy, that Akadosh Baruch Hu wants our heart, then the obvious question is, what exactly is this heart that we're talking about? What he wants is he wants to be connected to us. Who, who exactly is the us that he wants to be connected to? Right? So you could think, if you want to talk about the sort of inner sense of connected to Kaddish Baruch the question is, is that me or just something I'm thinking about? Right? So the reality is, what makes a human being human? What defines our humanity uniquely from any other entity in creation? It's the connection between a neshama and a goof. The fact that we are spiritual beings and physical beings. Well, really, the and is not really the right word. We're not these two elements, but really we're in an, an indescribable merging of these two entities. Who are you? We all have a neshama, and the neshama all emanates directly from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. We all have a body. We all have a presence in the physical world. What makes each one of us an individual? What makes each one of us distinct is the fact that that spiritual entity called the neshama, it merges with the body. And in that merging is created a unique individual. But who are we? We're not the neshama. We're not the goof. We're something that arises through the integration of those two. That integration that we ourselves create through our actions and our choices throughout our lives. <clears throat> Basically, says of Dessler, the significance of mitzvahs is... That if I have an ideal, when we talk about this inner sense of whatever, however you want to phrase it, this inner, these ideals that we have, 
if I am not compelled to act on those ideals, then they're not ideals, they're ideas. They're things that are in my mind, they're memories, they're thoughts, they are not me. How do I measure? How do I, de- how do I determine that a thought is not something that I'm just thinking, but is who I actually am? If it's integrated into my physical being to the point where I feel compelled to act on those ideals. Right? That's where we find the achievement of the integration between this internal self and that physical being, which is really who we are. Right? That aspect of us, our memories are not going to carry on to eternity. We are going to carry on to eternity, not our memories. But where's the we as opposed to the memories? It's those ideas that are so much a part of us that, they, that, that I need to act on them. Who I am in this merging between the physical and the spiritual, they come together and they express the fact that there's an ideal that I feel the need to act on. The mitzvahs are a litmus test. They're a measurement for, and again, we have to do, it's not, through the mitzvahs we can measure the fact that an ideal is really a part of us and not merely something that we're thinking about. I think maybe the, 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 the word we're really looking for here is where is our dedication, right? What are we dedicated to? Who, you know, what really defines who we are? And really, this is, the, this is what Sphere of Omer has been all about the whole time. Those are the, we've, we've spoken about this a few times already during the last couple of weeks, that that whole focus on midot, the midot are that bridge between the two. The midot are where that spiritual self and that physical being actually integrate with one another and the development of that aspect of our personality so that our physical being becomes a medium to express those spiritual ideals rather than merely using consciousness as a way to find my own self, to, to fulfill my own selfish needs. That's the process of Sphere Soma. That's how we get ourselves to Kabbalah Satara. Meaning if Kabbalah Satara is all about connecting up to a Kaddish Baruch where we, who we truly are connect up to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, the preparation for that is developing this we-iness. If you want to put it that, the we-iness, which is who, that identity of who I am as an instrument for expressing the spiritual ideals of my neshama. You could ask an obvious question, which Chazal do ask, which is, why do it this way? Now, why is it make a being that's spiritual and physical so he has to go to all the trouble of developing himself so the two are integrated to have the connection to Kaddish Baruch Why not just create a world and have a relationship with Malachim? I understand in your mother's eyes you are. But in a Kaddish Baruch Hu's eyes it's a little bit more complicated than that. Right? Why not? Why, why, why go through this process where who it is that we are that's trying to relate to is such this complicated process of creation. Just, do it to, just go straight to the Malachim. The answer is because we don't appreciate how astonishing we are. Right? A human being, when we talk about a spiritual essence, we're talking about something that's called Selim Elohim. We're talking about a spark from a Kaddish Baruch Hu himself. Right? We, have, we have a divinity to us which is so remarkable that if there wasn't a physical vessel to contain it and hold it, it would simply be, it would simply disappear back into a Kaddish Baruch Hu himself. Right? Think of that moment in our Sinai when a Kaddish Baruch Hu reveals himself to the Jewish people with Anochi Hashem Elokecha. What happened in that moment? The Medrash tells us everybody died, right? It's not the ideal first date, but whatever. It's like, Everybody died. But what does it mean that people died when a Kaddish Baruch Hu spoke those words, Anochi Hashem Elokecha? What it means is that a Kaddish Baruch Hu revealed his existence with such clarity that that neshama that is so definitive of who we are just could not hold back from returning back to its source. Right? Under normal circumstances, the Kaddish Baruch Hu is not so revealed. But this moment gives us a sense of exactly what the neshama is. The neshama is actually an extension of a Kaddish Baruch himself. As a result of that, the only thing that holds us, that allows us to exist, that allows that Neshama to exist separate from him, is the fact that it's in a physical vessel. Right? Think of 
a, a breath that you want to capture, right? The only way you can capture it is if you blow it into a balloon. There has to be something that holds it, right? It's actually something a little bit more intense than that here. But that, that's a reasonable first metaphor for understanding why it is that creation necessarily has to be with beings that are physical also. Kaddish Baruch Hu is re- that what justifies creation is the fact that the beings that he's relating to us, human beings, are that sacred. They are that high. You are that special. Right? You have an element of a Kaddish Baruch Hu himself inside of you. We all have that inside of us. We spoke also, obviously, a, a, lo- a longer discussion. Understand that the, in addition to this, if there wasn't some level of blocking of our vision of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, we would not be able to make any choices. What makes any relationship meaningful is that we enter into it voluntarily, right? That relationship, the love of one person to another cannot be dictated. It can't be something that has to happen. It has to be something that a person chooses for it to be, have any meaning. Our physical being is a thing that allows us to be entities that choose. Both the, the alumni and present students don't need to go into uh, all the time that we spent on understanding exactly how significant this idea of making choices is to this relationship with the Kaddish Baruch The bottom line is, what it is to be human, to be a physical being as well as a spiritual being, and what our job is as we move towards Har Sinai is to bring these two together. We have to answer that question, right? Am I a Nisham expressing myself through a group? Or am I a group? It's just enjoying the time here, using the Nishama as a, as a pilot to get me to my own selfish needs. That's the question we're asking. That's who we are. That's, how we're, that's what we're doing is we're moving toward our Sinai. But what exactly is, what is this dedication we're talking about that we're trying to, that, that's that moment on Harsinai? What does it really look like? What are we really describing here? And, and this really gets to the essence of what Shavuos is all about and what is that we spend our lives trying to achieve. And that moment of closeness is a connection that's so deep that we cannot distinguish our own individual being from our connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's a lot of words, but it's that's the goal. That's what it means to be close to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and that was the moment that we experienced on Har Sinai. Say it again. Yeah. What does it really mean? What is the closeness that we're talking about here? And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go into more detail. I'm, I'm going to explain it in a second. But what does it mean to close? What does it really mean to be close to the Kaddish Baruch Hu? It's to come to the point where I cannot distinguish myself, my identity, from my connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Where do we see this? The one description of what it was like to be on Har Sinai that we find in the Chumash is that in the context of everything that was going on there, the thunder, the lightning, the shofar, the voice of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, in Parshish Yisro we're told that as we were listening to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, we were rowing as Hakolos. We saw the voice of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's what the Pasuk says. What exactly does this mean? What does it mean to see a voice? So again, we've spoken about this before for the, for the alumni. This will also be a little bit of a trip down memory lane. But when we talk about Chumash, whenever we're dealing with Torah, we're dealing with a document that is always aware of a deeper conceptual context than what it's just talking about. When you use words like seeing and hearing, you have to understand what is the, what what are the what 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 are these what, is it, what does it really mean to see something and what does it really mean to hear something? So sight is a connection to something which is compellingly real. Once upon a time, seeing was believing, and then we got Photoshop. Right, that's part of the gullus, Right? <laughs> what is Ria Raya? Same word. Proof. Sight. Same thing. Seeing is believing. Right. Seeing is engaging something in a way in which its reality is compelling for you. There's a limitation on what you can see. You can only see something that's right in front of you. But what you see is real. Hearing gives me connection to things that are much further away. 
But we don't say hearing is believing. Right? I can't testify in court about things I hear. I can only testify in court about things that I see. Right? If I hear behind the wall something going on, I have an idea of what's going on there, but I don't know for sure what it's really all about. I'm connected to it, but without clarity. Hearing is a connection to something where I can connect to more things, but the compelling reality of it is on a much lesser level than it is by sight. Normally, what it, the way that we experience ourselves in this world, post Rishon, is what's real for us is pizza. Right? What's real for us is our physical experience. Right? I think uh, any of the President Shana Aleph students will be able to say this over, right? Taking you down to a moment in the dining hall on pizza day, those days when you rush out of your Ramchal class with such vigor, right? You remember those moments of biting into, really, the pizza isn't so good. Whatever, let's, let's take you to it. Okay, right? right? What's the place on the corner that everybody goes to? Uh, what? David's? No, they don't go there. Denya. Say cheese? Which one is that? Oh, Shalzen? They changed hands. We're not talking about this. This is a painful subject for me. Whatever. Anyway, you're biting through the sort of cornmeal that keeps the crust from sticking to the pan, through the crunchy, slightly burnt part until you get to the soft, doughy part in the middle. Then finally your tooth breaks through and through the chewy cheese so that the, the, that slightly melted salty oil hits your tongue and gun ate it, right? Right? It doesn't get any better than this, right? Right? So, <laughs> I'm embarrassing Mrs. Kagan once again. Okay, there. seems to be a continuing theme in our marriage. Okay, whatever. But the, well, let's face it, real ladies, that pizza is real, right? No South Africans, although we could talk about bull tongue, whatever. But the uh, physical reality is real for us, right? And then when, I don't know, who's the most, who's the most esoteric like, teacher in the school at this point? Rabbi, Rabbi Turner is talking about, I don't know, whoever's talking about the seventh rakia and all these other kinds of things. Who, who talks about these things now? Silver. There you go, Mrs. Silver, right? Mrs. Silver is talking about the, she goes to the eighth rakia. They don't even have an eighth rakia, whatever. But the, you're talking about the, all these, you know, it's like, eh, they hear it. You know, it's like very distant because it is not the reality that we occupy. We live in the physical world with an internal connection to a spiritual reality. We know that it's there, or we're pretty sure that it's there. We're connected to it. But it isn't the actual reality that we occupy. Right? We would call spiritual experience, for us, is called hearing something. Whereas physical experience is called seeing it. When it says that Harsinai, we were rowing es hakolos, we saw the voice of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, these words have to ring in our eyes. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? The reality of a Kaddish Baruch whose presence and connection was compelling. It was reality for us. And the only way to understand that is that what happened on Harsina was not something that happened to us, but it was something that was us. Meaning, that we were transformed in the moment of Har Sinai. Instead of being a body with a neshama, we became a neshama with a body. Right? We occupied, we were present in that spiritual, we were defined around that spiritual dimension, and our bodies became, it's like, it's like, it's a, very difficult to imagine, but I could be standing up here talking about, say, cheese, and you say, mm, I hear it. You know, it's like, it's, uh, yeah, why would anybody do that, right, to themselves? Right, whatever. But the, just saying that it was flipped. We became neshamas with a goof instead of a goof with a neshama. At that point, the compelling reality of a Kaddish Baruch Hu was something that was more real to us than our own existence. Right? That was what that moment of our Sinai was really all about. That's what it means to say that at that moment the, the Jewish people died. Right? What it means is that it became incredibly, it was not possible for us to hang on to our own individual existence in that moment 
because the Kaddish Baruch was more real to us at that moment than our own individual existence. The Rambam actually holds that we did not hear the words Anoch Hashem Elokecha. The Rambam understands that what happened on Hersinai was we were so intensely aware of the presence of the Kaddish Baruch Hu that the implication of that was Anoch Hashem Elokecha. Asher Otsay Sicha Meiris Mitzrayim. Meaning, we didn't need the... It's not the words. We didn't even hear the words. It's what the words imply that we experienced. <laughs> HaKadosh Baruch Hu was there to the point where we, we, we weren't able to hold on to the fact that we were connecting to him as opposed to him to us. In that moment, right, we talk about, we talk about the Shechina of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The way to understand it, I think, one of the easiest ways to understand it is like this, that the Shem of the Shechina of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is yud He. We have a number of different names for Kaddish Baruch Hu. When we talk about the Shekhinah of Kaddish Baruch Hu, we're talking about his connection to physical reality. That's really what we're talking about. The first half of the Yud Kei Vav Kei, right? The second half of the Yud Kei Vav Kei is talking about his actualization into history. But the first half is his actual connection to physical reality, which actually comes necessarily through Kol Yisrael. Right? Kaddish Baruch Hu does not connect to physical reality. The Gemara tells us, that your sukkah, the schach in your sukkah cannot be closer to the ground than ten tfachim. And explains the Gemara why. Because that schach represents the presence of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, the connection of a Kaddish Baruch Hu to the world, and he himself doesn't come within ten tfachim of, of the ground. Okay, again, these numbers, the, the, the numbers are not important to us so much as what the Gemara is really trying to communicate is a Kaddish Baruch Hu is a completely spiritual being and has no direct connection to physical reality whatsoever. How is he connected to physical reality? He's connected through us. Effectively, the hay of the yud hay is really Kal Yisrael. As we've spoken about so many times, right? When we look at this letter of hay, right, we see it has two parts to it, right? There's a as a dalid, right, which is the represents you know for those of you who remember your geometry, I know painful remem- memory, right? A flat physical coordinate plane. It has no depth to it whatsoever. It's physical reality without meaning. The Yud is a connection to a realm of being. Right? Kaddish Baruch Hu is this... The Yud is a letter that doesn't touch the ground. It's complete spiritual reality. The He, which represents... A, 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 the, together with it, Yud represents a Kaddish Baruch's connection to the world, is that physical reality with that spiritual entity inside of us. The He is effectively the Jewish people. Right? This is who we are. Which means that this spiritual core, which represents our nisham exactly, it's chelak elokami mal. It's coming from there. It's coming from a kaddish baruch This is who we are. Meaning, we're a physical being, but when we connect up to that true internal self that's so divinity, we want to know where is that really emanating from? What's its ultimate source? It's coming into us from the Kaddish Baruch Hu. It's the Vayipach Papav Nishma. Nishama means breathing. Who's breathing are we talking about? Nishama. We're talking about the breathing of... We're talking about the breathing of the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Right? We live very far away from this reality. We live anchored very much in our physical being. But we have the potential to go within deeper and deeper and deeper. And if we go deep enough, what we will find is that we are effectively a channel for a Kaddish Baruch Hu into this world. What is our humanity? What makes me a me? I am a potential, a possibility for bringing this into the physical world. Right? My very, I can't separate my identity from that, not merely the connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu, but it's a very specific kind of a connection. I'm the one that affords a Kaddish Baruch Hu expression into the world, and that's who and what I am. We talk about dedication. When we talk about mitzvahs, right? We're coming to Harsinai. What are we missing? We're missing the mitzvahs. But the point of the mitzvahs is, for us, the point of the mitzvahs is there's a sp- specific actions that we need to be doing. But why do we need to be doing Not because we already need them done. But because through doing those actions and defining myself around those actions, what I'm doing is I am becoming this person who's bringing Kaddish Baruch into the world. Right? The point that, 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 
ultimate sense of closet, which itself is a mitzvah, that dodecha, that incredible love that we feel for HaKadosh Baruch, when we feel Him feeling towards us, is expressed in the fact that I am aware of myself as a conduit of the Ratzon of HaKadosh Baruch into the world. Right? And it's based on this, that one of the names of a Kaddish Baruch Hu is actually Ani. Right? I. Right? I. There's the possibility that my awareness of myself as an individual is actually a name of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. I mean, I can come to the point where that identity of subjective individual self is actually indistinguishable from connection to a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That is a connection to Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's actually the deeper side of why the mitzvah of Amuna comes to us in the language of Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Right? We, when we read the Torah, we say Anochi Hashem Elokecha. It's a very funny thing. We're referring to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, Right? We're referring to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, but we say Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Now that can, you can only do that if you become if the I is a small I and not a capital I, right? Where you're aware, when you use that term, that I-ness is actually anchored beyond me. It's not inside of me. It's a very strange concept, very difficult to grasp onto. But I can use the word I, and it doesn't mean me, it means through me. It doesn't mean me, it means through me. It's anchored someplace else. This really, you know, on Harsinai, what do we hear? We had an Ochesh Amalok Kecho. You know, this is the mitzvah that commands us in Amuna. Right? What does Amuna really mean? <laughs> what does it mean? You know, I'm, I say the words. What does it help? What am I really requiring? What does it mean to say that I believe that God exists? Essentially, what we learned on Harsinai was what it really means to believe in God is to experience his existence more intensely and more compellingly than my own awareness of myself as an individual. It's a big thing. It's a big thing. But and I, I don't mean to, I, I suppose you probably think I sound abstract. <laughs> but, you know, on a certain level... In those moments when we're alone with ourselves, those are the moments of, for, that give us the potential for a sense of real connectedness to the Kaddish Baruch. Those are, those are the moments that give us the possibility for this kind of a moment. Right? If I could actually taste myself on that level at all, again, a moon is like, it's like, you know, who needs you to say, I believe, to say those words? What does it mean that I could stir myself up to... to or I come to an intellectual awareness that God is there, or even intellectual proof that God must exist, none of this is adequate. Right? What it really means to believe in a Kaddish Baruch Hu is his existence is more real to me than I am, and the only place to get there is through an awareness of my own sense of self. Right? I said this before, the alumni may have heard this from me before, one of the reasons why the moon is so weak in the generation that we live in is because we really don't spend any time being aware of our own existence. Right? The Pasik in Tehillim says, Lahagid Babokar Chazdecha Vemunascha Balelos. To say in the morning the Chesed of a Kaddish Baruch Hu and his Amuna at night. So Moshe Shapiro explained, we recognize the Chesed of a Kaddish Baruch Hu in the morning because in the morning the light is there and we see all the, ama- the amazing world that he's created for us. Right? All the things that are out there. Right? Your teacher, it's your student. <laughs> the student, then it's the lunch. But whatever. But the, you know, the world full of the chesed of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, all the things. But because we so, we are so distra- we're so distracted by our awareness of this world that the Kaddish Baruch given us, we forget that there's a me looking at that world. Right? We're so involved in looking at the world and understanding the world, we forget that there's a me that's looked at, a, myself that's looking at that world. When do you have an opportunity to be aware of that self is when the world disappears. And when does the world disappear? 
Belelos, when the lights go out. When the lights go out and you're alone with yourself. But we live in a world where the lights never, they never go out, right? It's always morning for us, right? The lights are always on. We're very, very far away from it. In his words, we live in a society that's made war on night, right? We don't have those moments of quiet, internal awareness, separate from the world around us, to engage that anochi and to taste the fact that it's connected, it's nothing more than the emanation from something larger, something higher than us. Shvuas is the time to try to remember that. Right? Shvuas is, we are, as we move towards Shvuas, that moment on, you know, as the, as, the, as, the, as the light is dawning in the morning on Shvuas after that long night, however it is that you spend your Shvuas, right? the moment of Anoche Hashem Elokecha, that's what we are trying to remember. That's what we're trying to re-engage. That's what we're trying to emphasize. That's what we're trying to understand. That's what we're trying to reconnect to. And what it means to connect to that is really what, what our Sinai and Kabbalah story is all about. It's all about Emuna, which is the basis of all the mitzvahs. And the Emuna is predicated on the ability for us to actually be able to experience ourselves. I'm not trying to be so abstract. It sounds abstract. I invite you to spend time thinking about what I'm saying because ultimately, in the world that we're living in, this is the key to everything because the world only becomes increasingly distracting with every passing day. Right? We're, giving, we're always given more and more excuses and invitations to distract ourselves from ourselves. And one of the things that it does to us is it empties us out in a way that it makes immune something very difficult to be meaningful to us. Right? Shvuas is a time to be thinking about these ideas and trying to reconnect with them. And, uh, you know, and that, 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 allow, that gives us a foundation for the rest of the year and all the misses that come along with it. Pleasure.